Welcome to the Right to Reason podcast. I'm your host, Robert Stanley. We've been having a lot of laughs lately with Thomas Westbrook talking wacky science, our one-year anniversary, and the crew have left at the valley. But today, we're getting back to academics. Today, we're getting into history. We're talking anthropology. This episode is going to challenge you about things you didn't know that you didn't know. It seems the new theme of intelligentsia is to look into religious history and argue that there are particular metaphorical truths available to us that have been waiting silently beneath the sands of old times long past. And these psychological truths have meaning and value in this present age. Here's Brett Weinstein talking about just that. We have minds that are programmed by culture that can be completely at odds with our genomes. And it leads to misunderstandings of evolution, like the idea that religious belief is a mind virus, that effectively these belief structures are parasitizing human beings and they are wasting the time and effort that uh, those human beings are spending on that endeavor rather than the more reasonable interpretation, which is that these belief systems have flourished because they have facilitated the interests of the creatures involved. Our belief systems are built around evolutionary success, and they certainly contain human benevolence, which is appropriate to phases of history when there is abundance and people can afford to be good to each other. The problem is if, if you have grown up in a period in which abundance has been uh, the standard state, you don't anticipate the way people change in the face of austerity. And so what we are currently seeing is messages that we have all agreed are unacceptable re-emerging because the signals that we have reached the, the end of the boom times, those signals are everywhere. And so people are triggered to move into a phase that they don't even know that they have. Despite the fact that human beings think that they have escaped the evolutionary paradigm, they've done nothing of the kind. And so we should expect the belief systems that people hold to mirror the evolutionary interests that people have rather than to match our, uh, our best instincts when we are capable of being good to each other because there's abundance. We have those instincts and so it's not incorrect to say that human beings are capable um, of being marvelous creatures and being quite ethical. I would argue there's a, a simple way of reconciling the correct understanding that religious belief often describes truths that in many cases fly in the face of what we can understand scientifically with the idea that these beliefs are adaptive. Um, I call it the state of being literally false and metaphorically true. A belief is literally false and metaphorically true if it is not factual, but if behaving as if it were factual results in an enhancement of one's fitness. To take an example, if one behaves in, let's say, the Christian tradition uh, in such a way as to gain access to heaven, one will not actually find themselves at the pearly gates being welcomed in, but one does tend to place their descendants in a good position with respect to the community that those descendants continue to live in. So if we were to think evolutionarily, the person who is behaving so as to get into heaven has genetic interests. Those genetic interests are represented in the narrow sense by their immediate descendants and close relatives. In the larger sense, they may be represented by the entire population of people uh, from whom that individual came. And by acting so as to get into heaven, the fitness of that person, the number of copies of those genes that continue to flourish in the aftermath of that person's death will go up. So the belief in heaven is literally false. There is no such place. But it is metaphorically true in the sense that it results in an increase in fitness. Jordan Peterson and Matt Dillahunty debated this very topic. I, th 
thought it would be nice if we started with something quick and easy and simple, like God. <laughs> uh, in particular, I, I don't believe there is one, and I have no idea what your thoughts are on it. You mean on the fact that you don't believe there is one? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean just about the subject in general, but I'm happy to hear your thoughts on about what I don't think is, well, maybe. Well, it's a complicated problem, and I don't think that we take it with due seriousness. I specifically don't think that the celebrity atheist types, who I actually have a fair bit of respect for, by the way, take it with due seriousness. So I don't think that they take it with due seriousness from a biological perspective or a phenomenological perspective or a literary perspective or a metaphoric perspective. That'll do for starters. Um, I become convinced that the fundamental presuppositions of our very functional cultures, or Western cultures say, are nested immovably in a metaphorical substrate and that when you enter that metaphorical substrate, you're in the domain of religious phenomenology. And I think that not only can you derive that conclusion as a consequence of deep philosophical thought and literary analysis, but, it, but that if you know enough about brain function, you'll also come to the same conclusion. I think you come to the same conclusion as well if you look at the evolution of religious cognition from the perspective of an evolutionary biologist and not from the position of a evolutionary biologist whose head is addled by the belief that most of human morality was established in the 500 years since the Enlightenment. So that's a start, I guess. Except, and uh, so you have to bear with me, because yep. I'm from Texas. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'm from Alberta, you know. It's bigger than Texas, just as bad. Yeah. So the, curi the curious thing for me is um, all of that applies, seemingly, if I'm understanding it, to uh, religious thought, uh, religious tradition, the value of religious identity to individuals. And I don't see that any of it relates to whether or not there is a God or whether or not there's sufficient reason to believe there's a God, which is my sticking point. I, I'm fully fine with the idea, oh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll try and get th through this without, like, <laughs> raucous applause, but, you know, hey, at least I got one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't never complain about raucous applause. <laughs> uh, because it's, that's the sticking point for me. I have no problem acknowledging that people derive value from their beliefs, whether or not they map to anything in reality, um, that they can be inspired and motivated, educated, uh, and enlightened by poetry, pose, prose, metaphor, uh, allegory. But my concern is, having grown up a fundamentalist Southern Baptist, the people who I know and some of the people who are working to enact legislation on behalf of their beliefs are convinced that they have good reason to believe that there actually is a God, not just that it's useful to them. Well, it's not that easy to distinguish between what's useful and what's real. So I think that that distinction can be made, but it's a lot more difficult than people generally think. And I also think that there's no doubt that there are different levels of sophistication of religious belief. You know, what I see happening in this sort of discussion, say, frequently. Um, you know, and again, like I said, I have a fair bit of respect for the atheist types because they spend a lot of time thinking, and that's generally a good thing. You know, I see most of, the, of their thinking, however, directed at the fundamentalist types, the fundamentalist Christian types, mostly of the American persuasion, who suffer from the somewhat understandable illusion that the biblical corpus has the same epistemological and ontological status as a scientific theory, when it clearly doesn't, right? I mean, if you're... Okay, a, now we're closer to the same page. Okay. Yeah. If you're a religious thinker, let's say, if you're a serious student of religious thought and a serious philosopher, the one thing, one of the things you can't claim is that whatever story the Bible is telling is a scientific theory. And that's just self-evident, first of all, like, when was the first scientist? 
Descartes, Bacon, Newton, maybe you could chase it back to the Greeks, but no farther than that. And so the idea that whatever the people who conjured up the Old Testament creation account were doing was something akin to scientific theorizing is a mistake that would only be made by people who don't know how to distinguish between different kinds of truth. And so the fundamentalists, like, I also, I feel for the fundamentalists, you know, because what they're trying to do to give them credit is to maintain a corpus of stories in which an ethos is based, that would be the Western ethos, for, in, in, in this case of Christianity, because they believe that the ethos is of extreme value. And I also believe that the ethos is of, a, of extreme value and that it is nested in those stories. And so they don't like to be confronted by the rationalist, atheist, evolutionary types because it blows the foundation of their ethos apart and they feel that it's worth preserving. And I think, well, yeah, it is worth preserving. Now, okay. that doesn't mean that there aren't philosophical problems associated with the manner in which they construct their arguments. But, well, well but what I'd like they're still I'm... worthy. That, but it doesn't address the issue. There's a deep issue here that, that, that we're not contending with. You know, here's an example. This is, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't think so. Um, I just finished, <laughs> well, I, I thought about it a lot, you know, and I do try to think about where I'm wrong, because I would like to figure out where I'm wrong, because then I wouldn't have to be wrong anymore, right? And being wrong is actually not a good thing. You fall into a pit if you're wrong. And this is so, what I point out in the lecture on skepticism, since you didn't get to see the show, is that being wrong feels exactly like being right, you don't, you don't, you, nobody runs around going, oh, I'm wrong, but I'm going to keep believing this. We all assume that we are correct about a great many things. And it is, it's not so much that being wrong is the thing we're afraid of. It's, I think, that being exposed as wrong is well, the that, thing we're that, afraid well, of. Well, we're, we're also sometimes afraid of being wrong because if you're wrong at a deep level, it can really hurt you. Oh, I agree. You know, it, it can. It can really take you apart. And so people don't like to be taken apart. Like if you're wrong about your wife, for example, that tends to be a very painful thing. And, and, and that's that's something that's worth pursuing to, to try that's to figure out why that is. That's why I hide the frying is. pan. <laughs> that should make you popular. Um. Today we'll be talking to Bernard Lamborel concerning his new book, The Covenant. He'll argue a couple of things about the Old Testament that will certainly blow your mind, such as God didn't become man, man became God. Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't gay, and the Muslims had it right all along. Are you having a WTF moment right now? Yeah. You have no idea. Today, we're taking a time machine back to where it all began. This is The Right to Reason. Now, a poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command Tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, you mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sand stretched far away. Bernard Lamborel is a secular humanist with an engineering degree from... He called the technology superior. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> During the day, he is a business entrepreneur in the field of high-performance network storage and cloud integration. Mm -hmm. At night and on weekends, he is an amateur historian passionate about ancient Israel. Since 2003, he's been investigating the idea that the biblical covenant was originally made with a mortal overlord rather than a divine entity. I'm going to need your help explaining that one in a minute. Mm -hmm. After publishing, help me out with this one. 
Kiproko Sergio. <laughs> okay, back in 2009, <laughs> he signed up for a master in theology at University de Montreal, mm -hmm. where he studied biblical Hebrew, historical critical methods, and narrative analysis. He recently published The Covenant on the Origin of Monotheism by Means of Deification, a historical essay that challenges the mainstream academia by offering a comprehensive evolutionary model for explaining the origin of monotheism. Mm -hmm. Bernard Lamborell, thank you so much for coming on our show today. Hey, thank you for having me on the podcast and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about this important topic. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean it's, it's really a fascinating concept and and that intro of yours is a mouthful. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? You sound like a, a quite the world traveler. Yeah, so I've been uh, traveling quite a bit. I enjoy, uh, you know, uh, visiting different uh, different cultures. Uh, I'm currently in Mexico and um, uh, just been uh, raised with a uh, skeptical and rational mind. And uh, my uh, my work has always been in, in engineering, and so I, I like problem solving. And uh, at the same time, I think uh, there's an important spiritual component to the human experience that has uh, kind of always been made me curious about the Bible. And um, yeah, so I got uh, involved into this uh, kind of an accident, really. Are you a former Christian yourself or, or believer in any way? Um, I, I, I mean, like, like most people are uh, in a sense that I was raised in a Christian family, but not really practicing. Uh, my mom, my mom is, is, is practicing now. Uh, my dad has always been kind of an atheist. So I've always kind of been bouncing between those two poles. And uh, that, that's what kind of draw me, you know, draw me back to uh, the Bible. Once in a while, I would have to kind of go back and try to understand what message was behind that, that uh, would resonate with me. And, um, you know, just kind of kept coming back and not making a lot of progress um, until um, about 15 years ago, when I kind of, I guess, got struck by uh, a question that took me down the rabbit hole, really. Yeah, I always kind of felt like with a lot of religious narratives that there was some kind of underlying truth to them, you know, some kind of uh, 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 moral quality about them, not that they're necessarily moral doctrines that we should mm -hmm. follow, but just that, the, you know, very, very basic concepts of right and wrong and, and tell the truth, turn the other cheek, you know, certain things like that, that I think a lot of us as, as secular humanists, we tend to to leave out that there might be there might be some some quality concepts there amid all the rape and violence of the old testament and what have you right yeah yeah and and i think uh, you know throughout the ages uh, humans have been trying to explain the unexplainable and um you know at, at the same time we're a product of our time i mean back then they were a product of our of their time and um, you know it, it's interesting because uh, just a few weeks ago you had the uh, hector garcia talking about his book the alpha to god and uh, and and just before that you had don barker from uh, freedom from religion foundation and and they both are talking about the same topic really the idea that this god looks like a man <laughs> you know he looks like some kind of a king uh, i mean uh, dan is working on a book at the end of worship he mentioned that still some while while to come out but uh, you know he's he's looking at it from the perspective of some kind of a king you know why do we worship why 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 is god looking so manly well uh, interestingly enough uh, my work which again started up about 15 years ago has brought me to conclude that he was a man and that's the reason you know the 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 the, the, the god that made a covenant with abraham i mean if you go back 2000 years before christ that was a time when pharaohs would look at themselves as gods and uh, it's it's amazing when you look at the story of the covenant in the bible and you visualize um, the Lord to be a man, the story takes a completely different perspective. And, and that's, that, that was kind of the beginning of this long quest for the me. The Christian concept of God becoming corporeal man, mm -hmm. in a way, is, is reverse in, in <laughs> what actually happened. In a way, man became God through legend. Yeah, exactly. Oof. I kind of I want you to unpack this for us, but it's kind of a big concept. Let me just throw this out there real quick, just so I can kind of get a better feel for it. Is this like some particular uh, warlord or king or something that they then the Jewish tradition then started saying was a form of deity? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, in, in my book, I, uh, you know, and the research I've done has brought me to conclude that because once you pose the idea of a mortal man, then it, it has to be a historical event. Because when you look at it from a religious perspective, there is no way you would be able to, to get there. But when you, when you pose the idea that he might have been a man and, and you start looking into the historical context and you start trying to figure where, when, why and how this could have happened, um, I mean, that brought me to conclude that it, it must have been uh, King Hammurabi from Mesopotamia, but we're, we're a far stretch from the beginning of the quest here. We're kind of towards the end. But that, that, that from my perspective, I think, even though I'm, I'm very, uh, very confident that we can demonstrate he was immortal, uh, I'm slightly less confident in, 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 the, uh, in the target, although, although I do think there's quite a strong case to be made for King Hammurabi. Okay, so maybe, maybe you're saying we jumped ahead a little bit. Yep. Am I getting you right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, take us, take us back. Don't let me, don't let me jump us ahead again. <laughs> no <laughs> it's, just, it's really fascinating, it's so that's good. why I kind of just want to get right to it, you know? Sure. <laughs> okay, so take us back in time yeah. here. Give us the full, the full narrative that we can kind of get the concept that you're presenting. Okay. Um, yeah, because we're, it, uh, you know, it's a far stretch from mainstream understanding of the story. Um, you know, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge just how significant that covenant is for the faithful. Um, you know, we, we call them Abrahamic religions, and there's a reason for that, because that covenant with Abraham uh, kind of signaled the the beginning of the faith. Uh, I mean, you you can you can remove Adam and Eve in some ways. You can remove Noah's Ark. You can even go as far as removing the Exodus and still maintain your faith. But if you acknowledge that this covenant was made with a mortal and that mortal was deified, and that's the God you're worshiping, then obviously there's a big problem there. And and so that covenant, the concept of covenant, is the umbilical cord that attaches us to God or, or the faithful or the believers to, to God. And, um, you know, it still has repercussion today when you look in politics, uh, you look at the state of Israel and some of the claims that are made on the promised land. Uh, you look at even uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, which was the uh, self-proclaimed leader of ISIS. He presented himself as Caliph Abraham, um, you know, and in, in basically in reference to that covenant to Abraham. So we cannot just ignore that. And I think this is why this is such important for atheists and scholars to reconsider the possibility that this covenant could actually originate, have originated from a secular covenant, not from a religious covenant, and that secular covenant would have elevated this uh, persona into a deity. And, um, you know, one more thing I would add to that is that at the time, because today, I mean, you know, I guess that's the second thing we need to look at is um, 50 years ago, a lot of scholars thought a fair amount of the Old Testament was reliable. And, you know, they were trying to confirm the Old Testament, but that kind of led them in all kinds of problems. I mean, the more they dug, the more they found that it did not match. And, um, you know, some 30 years ago, they pretty much came to the conclusion that no, that, that was all myth. Um, you know, there was new generation of scholars that started reconsidering and, and started focusing the birth of monotheism around the Babylonian exile. Uh, but unfortunately, we've kind of um, stopped all research on the origin of those myths. And, uh, you know, people seem to be just satisfied to say, well, it was a myth. But, you know, as you said earlier, a lot of the myths um, do come from something. And what I'm trying to show in the book is that um, the covenant made with Abraham um, can actually be demonstrated and proven with a number of arguments that it must have originated with a mortal lord that was defied. There's just no alternative to this. That was one thing that I noticed when, when studying Western civilization in college was that I had just taken – I, I come from a religious mm -hmm. background, so I, I kind of did a lot like what you were saying – uh, uh, scholars did, you know, 50 mm -hmm. years ago, where I just assumed that the Old Testament was at least somewhat yeah. accurate historically. Even even after I lost my faith and I, I became an atheist, I still thought, well, I mean, that probably is our best understanding of what was going on in yeah. Mesopotamia at that time and, and what have you. But as I started, uh, uh, you know, having to study for 
these history <laughs> tests, you know, I found out, wait a minute, none of this stuff is right. Or it's, I don't want to say none of this stuff yeah. is right. Let's say like an example where they would talk about uh, uh, King mm -hmm. David. Yep. Whenever we actually study who this person was, well, it was just some warlord yeah. while they were getting their butts kicked from one town to another. And the, the whole story of, of spending 40 years in the <laughs> wilderness, there might be some kind of truth to that. It's, it's not likely that it was that amount of time necessarily, but they were they were mm -hmm. being run out of everywhere that they were. Whenever it says that God sent them through yeah. the wilderness, you know, as a punishment, just because <laughs> Moses hit a rock with a stick or something. You know what I mean? Like it, it's some silly, it's a silly version of what yeah. really happened, but there is some, some truth to it. It's just that they, they twist it every time that they add some kind of story of theology to yeah. it. Yeah. It was the, the king that the, the Bible talks about all the time. Was it Cyrus or Cyrus? Yeah. The, the Persian king. Yeah. And, during the Babylonian exile. And mm -hmm. that was another yeah. one where I noticed and the way I had grown up, I had always, thought this was historical, you know, but the Old Testament would refer to uh, Cyrus the Great and how he was, he was a big help to, to the Jewish people because God made him protect them in a way. Mm -hmm. And then we, we study history and we find out, no, he was just another oppressor that came along. It's just that his version of oppression was much more successful right. because he allowed people to maintain their religious, he gave them a little more. Freedom. Yeah, yeah they, yeah, they could still have their religion. Exactly. So the way that the yeah. Jewish tradition uh, memorializes this story is that it was just God forced him to come over and let us keep our Judaism. But that's not really right. what happens. I mean, whenever I come across your book and it's talking about, hey, there is some truth to the covenant, more or less. There was a covenant, but it's not really the way that it happened. That, I mean, all the all the alarms go off, all the bells go off in my head, and I think, that's it. This guy's yeah. onto something. Yes. Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, for the past 15 years, I mean, uh, of course, I sound very confident, and I am confident today, because 15 years later, I've, I've left, you know, as little, as few rocks unturned as possible. I've been all along my, I've been trying to challenge this idea. You know, initially, it was just kind of a hobby, something interesting, just curiosity. But the more I would look, the more I would try to challenge that idea, the more I would find evidence. And eventually I got enough evidence that I figured, well, I need to write something about it. And uh, it, that's that's been the whole story. And, and today I think I've got a lot of the pieces together that actually takes you back to, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole evolution. Like, because it's one thing, one thing to suggest, okay, it was a secular covenant, but how do you prove that? What are the evidence, both in the Bible, in archaeology, in chronology, in all, all kinds of places? What are the evidence that support that? And, and, and just as importantly, are there any counter evidence? Is there anything that would nullify that possibility? And so far, I found tons of evidence, and I have found nothing that would nullify that possibility. Uh, nothing that was uh, substantial. You know, of course, if you, depending how you interpret the scriptures and, and scriptures that were written hundreds of years later after there was no more memory of that man, but just a God. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, somebody could point at the Bible and say, well, look, it doesn't talk about a man here. But uh, other than that, uh, you can find in the text, I mean, first of all, the text of Abraham itself, um, both in terms of form criticism, historical critical analysis, uh, in terms of uh, textual criticism, all allow you to confirm this this reading. Um, but had to develop some some new methods as well for uh, looking at the text, and um, and then on archaeology and everything just points to that. I really want you to tell us about this guy mm -hmm. Hammurabi. But before mm -hmm. we get to that, I heard you mention mm -hmm. archaeology a little bit and. Okay, so we've got, in terms of actual physical things that we can look at today and say, okay, there's evidence for some of yeah. these Old Testament claims. Okay, we've got, what, the, mm -hmm. the Temple of Solomon, right? Um, is that it? I mean, is there anything yeah. else that we can look at and go, okay, we know the... Like, like I've heard I've heard so many scholars uh, say that the, the Jews were never even in Egypt. The whole mm -hmm. story... Of Exodus. <laughs> yeah, let my people go, and and the Jews built the pyramids allegedly, and then you know they're they're forced into the wilderness, and yeah. and they're having to survive off of 
manna from heaven, which is really just magic bread. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this whole story where f dropping frogs <laughs> yeah. down on everybody and killing firstborn, and th there's no evidence that they right. were ever in Egypt at all. And I'm wondering, like, other than Solomon's temple, do you know of any kind of archaeological evidence for sure. the Jewish people? Well, that's that's interesting. Um, for the Jewish people themselves, I mean, you you know, I think the the only pieces of evidence we have is the uh, Meneptah's tale, uh, you know, which mentioned Israel, and that's dated from about 1200 before Christ. But I, I think the most important archaeological evidence is the the the, the temple of Baal Berith that is in uh, in Naplus. The time of the construction of that temple is the uh, 18th century uh, before before Christ and it was they stopped uh, worshiping Baal Berith uh, around the you know again 12th 13th century before Christ and uh, Baal Berith in in Hebrew means Lord of Covenant you have this Baal Berith which was built Naplus at the time was Shechem which is the town or the, the village where Abraham lived and uh, his descendants that's where you have his tomb uh, and, and where they're supposedly buried. Of course, we haven't found evidence of that. And, and what I'm trying to show in my work is that Baal Berith was very likely the first deified version of this Lord. And, and that was basically worshipped as, you know, just a, a pagan god, Baal. And I'm also showing how Baal uh, was worshipped alongside other deities, including Asherah, which was a feminine deity. And, and I'm showing how from a etymological standpoint the name Yahweh the the tetragrammaton can actually derive from the combination of Baal Yah or Lord Yah and Asherah or Bala which was the feminine oh side God. and so you end up exactly with that that tetragrammaton and the timing wait, 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 wait. Yeah. You're, you're blowing my mind uh -huh. I hate I hate to interrupt you but I mean this is this is fascinating you're saying that the Asher uh, or, Asherah as, as, I remember it being like a, a seer okay. in the Bible, okay. but maybe, okay, maybe I'm mispronouncing it. Asherah mm -hmm. and then Baal. Mm -hmm. the, I, I grew up hearing these stories yeah. all the time about how God was saying, stop worshiping these other deities. That, that that happened because what they were supposed to do was worship the combination of those deities yes. and stop worshiping the former ones. That is yes. insane. I mean, and, and you can see, I mean, the, the timing as to when that would have occurred uh, matches. You know, you had uh, Akhenaton, which was the, uh, the the Egyptian heretic pharaoh, which tried to impose monotheism in Egypt. You know, that was right before Tutankhamun. And that was a time when Egypt was dominating Canaan. So it, it had extended its borders uh, to basically Canaan was a vassal state of Egypt at the time. And that's part of the how I show that Yahweh evolved from uh, this combination of deities because in Egypt, compounded deities were quite common. You know, you would, you would take attributes of multiple deities and, and create a more powerful uh, deity out of that. Uh, you would not refute the previous deities, but you would create, you would end up with a new deity. And, and I think that's exactly what happened in the Bible. We've, uh, the, the priest basically took the properties of the ancient gods that they were worshiping and created a new compounded deity called Yahweh and started worshiping Yahweh. And this is why we have evidence that Yahweh was worshiped alongside Asherah in some cases, and that Asherah kind of hung around in, for, for some time, and so that the Israelites kept going back to the ancient worship. Uh, and at the same time, they were, the, the priests were trying to refute all these other false gods, you know, and, and just focus on the new god, Yahweh, because Yahweh was really uh, the embodiment of their history. Their, their secular covenant. I mean, the, the reason they had this land is because they, they did have a covenant. They didn't realize that they were worshiping, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, a dead man, they, because they had elevated his memory into a deity, right? Baal Berith. And um, so by then, uh, Yahweh was the embodiment of their previous deities. So it, it, it all makes sense because when 
during the Babylonian exile, they were basically instead of just inventing a new religion, which is, you know, I mean, inventing is maybe a big word, but a lot of scholars today would say that monotheism and the religion of Yahweh was really born in the aftermath of the Babylonian exile. Well, what I'm trying to suggest is that, yes, it was solidified, it was finalized, but they built upon what they already had. They built upon their old pagan uh, you know, covenant and added some of the uh, newer concept that the Persians had brought with them with Zoroastrianism. And, uh, and that became modern Judaism. And that also helps explain why there was this, there's still this um, issues with the Samaritan. You know, the Samaritans um, are this group of Jews, Orthodox Jews that only believe in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. And um, they reject everything else. Now, today's scholars have no explanation for that. How, how would these people uh, only have for their belief a set of myth that has nothing to do with the new religion of Yahweh? Well, because that was the original religion. They claim that was their religion, original religion, and I believe it's true. And, um, and so Yahweh is, is this compounded deity, and this is why he was more, pof- more powerful than Baal. Otherwise, how do you explain that this deity came out of nowhere and you know, from one day to the next, he's like the, mo- the, next, the next most powerful thing on earth? Well, you know, if he integrates the power of the previous gods, then it makes total sense. What gods do you pray to? I pray to the four winds. And you? To Pram. But I seldom pray to him. He doesn't listen. <laughs> what good is he then? Yeah, it's just as I've always said. He's strong. If I die, I have to go before him. And he will ask me, what is the riddle of steel? And if I don't know it, he will cast me out of Valhalla and laugh at me. That's Crumb. Strong on his mountain. Yeah, my God is greater. <laughs> Crumb laughs at your four winds. He laughs from his mountain. My God is stronger. He is the everlasting sky. Your God lives underneath him. What's this about how God had all these different kinds of, uh, like, natural forms? You know, like, sometimes it seemed like he, he appears as a tornado to Job, right? Or at another time, he's like, he's like, it's, it's almost as if they describe him as a volcano. Or at other times, he's like, the, the, the sky or something like that. Can you help us understand where, where maybe this could have been coming from? evolved out of other gods combining into one? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that uh, there has always been syncretism and, and translation. So between, between separate cultures that were revering or worshiping slightly different gods, you know, people would pick some of the ideas of nearby cultures and integrate them. So the, the Canaanites uh, on their pantheon, uh, you know, they had figures that would be very similar to uh, the gods of the Babylonians or the, guys, the gods of Egypt because they were in between those two states. And there's kind of a fundamental difference between the gods in Babylon and the gods in Egypt. Uh, the gods of Babylon um, and any dwelling places where people need water, like you, you can understand how um, vegetable can grow. You know, you you put a seed, you put water, and it grows and it needs the sun and all that. But the only element that you have no control over is the water. And so a lot of the god, Baal, Thor, and, and that were gods of the thunder. You know, they were the gods of the rain. And so it was important to worship wow. them to make sure you would get rain so your crop would grow, you know? And then they had they were always had a, 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 a goddess of fertility. And typically she would be celebrated in, in, in the spring. And, and, you know, you could, I think there, I've got a little blog on my, on my website where I, I kind of try to show that Ishtar, which is the, the goddess of fertility of the Babylonian, actually evolved into Easter. And, um, you know, how um, she was also uh, put to death and, and kind of resuscitated three days later and all that. So that's, that's more, Whoa, uh, that's, just like that's the, also just a the funny The resurrection yeah. story, it was three yeah. days? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where that's where the Easter story originated. 
Well, I think so. You know, I think there's a case that can be made for that uh, because nothing to do with Ishtar, butters and eggs and stuff. Well, yeah, it has to do with eggs. That's the whole thing because the, as a goddess of fertility, the eggs and the the rabbits are two symbols of fertility. And um, but the story of Ishtar is that she she kind of went into the underworld and she took over her sister's um, reign because her sister was reigning on the underworld, uh, the world of the dead. And uh, But she kind of got kicked out or not kicked out, but she got she died. The, the gods condemned her to die because of her attempt to kind of, you know, overthrown her, if you will. Uh, but then her her servant pleaded her case and three days later, uh, the, the main god allowed her to escape or to leave the underground, uh, but she had to kind of her her husband uh, had to take her place, and and so every six months they would kind of swap, and and so that that kind of give the, the narrative behind the, the seasons. But anyway, I mean that's that <laughs> it's taking us away from the uh, the story of Abraham, but it just goes to show that yeah yeah take take us take us back there. I'm <laughs> no, sorry. No, no problem. Just... <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating stuff, and I'm yeah. so like I'm so grateful to to have somebody that is so well versed in this kind of topic that I could just pick their <laughs> brain because I, I I love this topic, and I, I would assume the listeners do as well. Yeah, I would hope so. But yeah, tell us tell us about Abraham, and also can you can you kind of give us the story of Hammurabi a little bit? Yes. Yeah, sure. So uh, you have to visualize that Israel or today's state of Israel, which was Canaanite before, uh, is really enclaved between Mesopotamia, which is, you know, modern day Iraq and uh, and Syria, all the way up to Syria and, and Egypt. And so you have this, this small little um, strip of land that is a... Uh, that is a passage, right? A trade corridor between those two big nations. And so there's always been trading between those two. And if you look, if you look at the story of Abraham, one of the first thing that the story talks about uh, is the fact that um, Abraham and Lot, which is his nephew, kind of separate. And Lot goes and uh, settle near Sodom, right? And uh, and Abraham settles uh, in, in another place. And some Mesopotamian kings uh, come to do a punitive campaign because the people of Sodom, and that's that's textual in the Bible, the, the people of Sodom revolted. We, you know, we they know were Sodom. vassals for twelve years. They do, they do a lot of butt stuff there. Oh well, actually, the people of Sodom are freedom fighters, and they were just, oh. you know, there's always this thing where there's always two sides to the story: the side of the winner and the side of the loser. And uh, <laughs> and Sodom, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, were were lost. But they were freedom wait, wait, fighters, wait, wait. I, and I hate and to that's interrupt you. I, you know, the listeners that'll be like, "Robert, shut up, let them talk." <laughs> but I mean, it's like it's like you, you, you drop this mind blow over and over and over, and then you like you just move on to the next mind blow, and I'm like, "Hold on, I didn't get this." <laughs> Are you saying that potentially the whole story of like Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. that they had just lost the war, but then the victors recorded them as kind of like, Wicked. "Oh, they were just a they were just a bunch of gays, yes. and they they were." punished by God. But in reality, they just, they lost the battle. Yes. And, 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 wow. and, 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 and I mean, wow. you, you can see that in the text. Because the text clearly says they were vassals for 12 years, then they revolt. And then you have these Mesopotamian king that come for, to, to basically for a punitive campaign. And they pretty much succeed. They took away they leave with all the, the goods and the people, and they basically take the people away as, as a booty. And Abraham, because his nephew was part of the people that were taken away, he decides to go after these guys, chases them, and basically defeats them. And because he, he left with a little army of people. And, and he defeats them, and he comes back. Now, that's where it's exciting, because the story at that point, you would expect one of two things. You would expect either those Mesopotamian kings to retaliate or mm -hmm. to make an alliance with this guy Abraham. And that's exactly what happens in Genesis oh, 15. The Lord but really, makes a covenant it was, with it Abraham. Was people. Okay. It was it was a, yes, a king exactly. more or less. Exactly. That makes so much okay. sense. And and this is why I you know, I'm not sure why nobody ever clued in the fact that Genesis 19 where God destroys the city of Sodom and Genesis 14 in those two instances you have Mesopotamian king on one, you have the Lord on the other. They're both looking after subduing the people of Sodom, right? But in one case, in, in Genesis 19, the people of Sodom are wicked. 
they're sinners before the Lord. And so the Lord destroys them. But uh, before he destroys them, first of all, Abraham steps in and tries to negotiate and saves those people, right? And if, if they were that wicked, why would he try that? Uh, but the reason he's trying to save them is because he's trying to tell this Lord, listen, you know, there might be a few guys in there that are willing to submit to yeah. your authority. Yeah, like, but so what let if, me try what if to, there's, you know, what if to, there's to, 50 or exactly. what if there's 10 or what if there's five and he, he's, he's sitting there negotiating. Right. And then, and then the Lord gives in and says, okay, you're right. You know, if, if we can find enough good people, then I'll, I'll save them. I'll spare them. And then he, what does he do? He sends some messengers, right? Because in, in the Bible, we're used to see angels, but angels in, in, comes from the Greek angelos. In, uh, in Hebrew, it's malak, right? The terms that is in the Hebraic Bible, it's malak. And malak stands for messenger, just like Angelos is an, as a messenger. But Malak, when you know that in Hebrew, Melek is a king, then you understand that Malak is a messenger of the king. And so he sends these messenger to take a look as, you know, are there anybody in that city that are willing to submit? You know, what's the state of the, 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 the revolt there? And those guys get to the city and what happens? There's a mob of the, of the, the city that comes and tells them, you know, we want to know you, which means, you know, it's a euphemism for basically um, sodomizing them. And this is where the term sodomy comes from. But what are they trying to do? You know, they're not trying to have sex for pleasure. They're trying to send a oh, message. Yeah. They're trying to tell this king, this powerful king and these, these messenger, these uh, representative of the king, I'm going to make you feel what it's like to be submitted for 12 years. So you bend over and you submit. Okay, like in the movie 300, the messenger comes over and, and he kicks the guy into the hole and says, well, we are Sparta. Right. And, but the, the idea is you, you kill the messenger and you send back a strong message. Yes. And in this story with Sodom and Gomorrah, they rape the messenger, or at least they intend to. They're not going to To send back the message. We're going to resist. That, and this is why the Lord decides to destroy we, the we, city. Oh, wow. When you take the story of Abraham and you look at it from the forest perspective, so you stand out and you just look at the big picture, you realize that it makes complete sense. And, and all the elements of the story makes perfect sense. And when you dive into it, and, and this is why I took some, some uh, course in, in, in uh, biblical Hebrew was to, because some people were challenging me by saying, well, you know, you, you've worked out of translation. That's not worth anything. And, and so I went and worked on the Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and, and it even stronger. It's amazing how you can confirm some of this stuff. You know, some of the details in the story are really, really powerful and confirm this reading. It's just that nobody ever looked at it from the perspective of a mortal Lord. Everybody's assumed, everybody who's looked at this text have taken the approach, this is a religious covenant. Of course, it makes no sense in the Bronze Age. There is no such thing as monotheism. But the minute you approach it from a secular perspective and say, what if, then everything, wow. all the that pieces is, fall together, really they fall in place. Okay, yeah. and, and how does Hammurabi fit in all this? Or is that the guy that we've been talking yeah, about? Yeah, so Hammurabi is this guy. It would, would have been this lord. And the way I am trying to... He, show, he's the one that they yes. were sending the message yeah, to? He's, he's basically the guy okay, that... Okay. He's basically, from, from my perspective, he is Baal Berith, the lord of the covenant. The way I'm trying to show this, uh, there's, there's a number of ways that I'm trying to show this, but first of all, if you look at his own story and uh, you look at the story of Abraham, there's one thing that uh, doesn't fit. You know, chronology, the, 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 the chronology of the Old Testament has always been problematic. People have always said, well, you know, it doesn't work. This is one of the reasons it cannot have happened. But if you pose the idea that this Lord was a mortal and that this Lord was a Mesopotamian over king, then you have to look at you have to look at what they were using for math. And Babylonians were using sexagesimal. They were not using decimal like we are today. And, and what I'm trying to show in the book is that they would have very likely, when they compiled the Bible, the scribes that compiled the Bible, would have made a very simple, very obvious mistake when converting the numbers that were originally spelled out as sexagesimal and would have attempted to convert them to decimal. And, and, and it's super easy to make the mistake. I mean, I'll, if I tell you 
Well, first of all, I'll say, hey, Robert, how many minutes on your watch? Yeah, it's like about 12.09 or Yeah, but the number of minutes, like, like you have 60 minutes, 60 like seconds. 30. Right? Okay, yeah. So okay. it's sexagesimal. That comes from the Babylonians. You know, there's no other reason. Otherwise, you'd have 100 minutes, right? So you have 60 minutes because oh, that comes from right. Babylonia. And, uh, and same thing for angular calculation. We kept that because it was easier because of all the multiples and all that. But if I tell you, Robert, my watch actually has 100 minutes per hour, okay? And I'm telling okay. you, let's meet in a quarter of an hour. On your watch, that'll be 15 minutes. But on on my watch, 25. 25, right? Exactly. So what happened okay. is that the, the, uh, the scribes converted all the numbers, like they took 15 and made it 25 because they thought, well, I'm converting from base 60 to base 100. So it makes sense. You know, 15 is equal to 25. And they did that. And the problem when you do that is that minutes are a fraction of an hour, but days and years are not fraction of anything. So 15 years in sexagesimal, when you convert it to decimal, is still 15. But if you've converted them to 25, you've messed up everything. And so it's a very simple fix. Multiply all the numbers in the Old Testament by 0. 0.6. So 25 times 0. 0.6 gives you 15. And any numbers you have in the Old Testament, you multiply by 0. 0.6 and you're going to get the right number. And now when you look at the chronology of the Old Testament, instead of being all over the place, it's all lining up with the events that we know in history. And you can now map some of oh the biblical God. events to so history. That, that, that's fascinating. Would that also mean that the timeline that appears to be 6,000 years yeah, 60 is of really that. only 75% yeah. of that time? Yeah, so even, which would be even something closer to maybe. Wrong. <laughs> or yeah, sixty percent. Yeah, yeah exactly. so it'd be like, like maybe yeah, four thousand or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. and, and that can be shown. That makes so you know, much I, sense. I, uh, it everything makes sense. Everything makes sense. You just gotta open up to it and and try to understand. You know, you you look at just a generation. You know, in the Bible, it says a generation is forty years, yeah. right? And and it makes no sense if you talk to anybody who's done any kind of anthropology, they'll tell you the generation is much closer to. 20 something, you know, to about 20 years or something. Well, mm -hmm. if you make 40 times 0. 0.6, that gives you 24 years. So it's a lot closer. <laughs> uh, if you, you know, Sarah, the Bible says she was pregnant at 90 year old. Well, if you make 90 that's, times 0. That's, 0. 0.6, why. that's, that's why they, year old. she couldn't and conceive yes, that she was old. this 50 year old woman, exactly. but it's not like a silly, yes. ridiculous 100 year old woman story. Exactly. And, and she was able to conceive, and some women are still able to conceive. It is a, almost a miracle, and this is why the tradition is, makes so much about it, because, wow, you know, it was, it was totally unexpected, but she got pregnant. But how did she get pregnant? That's the interesting question. When you look at the Bible literally, right, because that's the whole idea. You, you look at the text of Abraham literally, and in Genesis 18.9, God is there with, with some messengers, and they basically tell Abraham, where is your wife? And Abraham says, right there in the tent. And a little bit later, the Lord visits Sarah, does unto Sarah what he said he would do. And nine months later, Sarah gives That's Abraham true. a son, Isaac. Who's fathered? Who has fathered well, Isaac? I guess God. And why is Isaac exactly the Lord? So the Lord made Sarah pregnant because Abraham, the half sister, kind of, of like Sarah, a, a was foreshadowing not able to of, get her of pregnant. Mary being impregnated by God and, and having Christ, maybe. Well, that's, that's what, you know, I think that might have been a uh, kind of a uh, replication of that idea. But yeah. it also explains perhaps why, you know, in a Jewish tradition, you're, Jew, you're Jew by your mother, not by mm. your father. You know, but that's, I mean, that's textual. And you can, when you look at it carefully in the Bible, and especially if you go back to the Hebrew Bible, you, you realize that it never says Isaac is the son of Abraham. He's the son that Sarah gave him. And it, it, there's a difference between how Abraham refers to Ishmael, which is his own son that he had with Agar, and, and Isaac. He raised him as his son, but the, the, it's, when, it's very interesting when you look at the text that it's not quite the same. But that brought, so, that brought a, a, an, an important question. And I almost gave up at that point when I ran into that, that thing because... I mean, when I first reread the story of Abraham trying to visualize this Lord or this God being immortal, the whole story made sense, right? The story with Sodom and all that and why he's 
about impregnating Sarah and everything made sense up to a point where right. he, the test of loyalty, because he's testing Abraham, he's telling him, well, now you, you're going to prove me your loyalty. You're going to sacrifice your only son, Isaac, right? And, right? and so it makes no sense because if Isaac was fathered by this Lord, he wouldn't expect the Lord to ask Abraham to sacrifice his own bloodline, right? So, it, so either oh. either the interpretation doesn't make sense, or the Bible is wrong, and it shouldn't be Isaac. And so, 15 years ago, when I ran into that, I'm like, "Ooh, there's a problem here, and maybe maybe I'm off the hook." But I, I started looking, and I didn't even know. But for half of the believers. Uh, in the world, for all Muslims, they they agree on the whole story of Abraham, except that very particular thing. They, from from a Muslim perspective, Ishmael is the son that Ab that the Lord asked Abraham to sacrifice. But from the uh, from the Jewish and Christian perspective, is Isaac. And and so why? Is there okay, this so discrepancy? so the story of yeah. Abraham and Isaac yeah. is going up, and, he, and yeah. he's gonna he's gonna kill uh -huh. Isaac. And then God gives him the goat or whatever instead. And horrible story. But you're saying it was actually Ishmael all along. Yeah. So the Muslims are right. Well, that's what the Muslim claim. They don't know why, but it's part of their tradition. And so when I realized that they, you know, I mean, for half the believers, they, they thought it was Muslim. Because Isaac wasn't even Abraham's kid. Exactly. According to the yeah, story. According to, to the so does that mean that Isaac was uh, the kid of some other king? In the story, or something like well, that. Oh, he was the king of Hammurabi. Oh, wow. he, he was the king of Baal, Baal Berith, and this is why the whole lineage following Abraham were really the seed of this Lord. So the right? Muslims had it right so, all along. Yeah, I think so. That, that's what I. Mean. I mean, kind yeah. of in a way, minus you know Muhammad flying yeah, up on well, a white horse yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, the good thing about this interpretation is that it relieves everybody from the need to believe in this, let's call it horrible God of the Bible. And it opens up space for spirituality and for letting go of those dogma. And it's just as, it's just as a relief for Muslims as it is for Christians and Jews. Nobody can claim, I was right, you were wrong. We were all wrong. That's beautiful, man. Uh, Bernard Lambrell, tell us the name of this book and how people can find it because this this message needs to get out there. It is absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> well, the uh, the book is called "The Covenant uh, on the Origin of Monotheism by Means of Deification," and it's available on Amazon, both as a uh, paperback and as a electronic. Um, it's also available on uh, Smashwords. You know, I'm I'm inviting everybody, uh, atheists, theists, scholars, and uh, laymen to uh, read it comment um, you know this is this is a dialogue i mean this the the idea i've, I've done a lot of work but um, you know everything remains to be done in terms of educating the world about this so i thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to share this with you oh, uh, no, thank you bernard lamborell everybody <laughs> is saying come at me bro <laughs> he said let's let's try it out let's see if there's anything wrong with this it makes it makes perfect sense i feel like yeah. <sighs> Like I'm, I'm still processing that. That that's a lot. That's a lot to take in. And I know we didn't even yeah. get into the real, the real crux of, of your book yet. I, I, I'd love to have you back on and, and talk about it a little bit more. And yeah, Kath, thank you for your time. Thank you very much again, Robert. Take care. Bernard is amazing. We keep talking after this. Stick around for that. Thank you to David Blair at DaveFreesong.com forward slash free music and Jason Camo at AlostateOfMind.com. You can find all of our content at TheRightToReason.com. Thank you to our patrons. Also, a special thank you to Waylon Coy for your gracious donation at TheRightToReason.com. You can also support us there or at Patreon.com forward slash right. Next week, we'll be hosting a debate between a Christian and a Muslim. Is the resurrection story true? Eric Lounsbury and Amir Aziz bump their big mics and then follow up with a few questions from an atheist, which I doubt they'll be able to answer. This is all live video and you can find it at our YouTube channel. See how the sausage gets made in real time. That's next week between now and then. 
you have the right to reason. Okay, once again, I, I hate to I hate to ruin the flow, so I'll I'll edit this part too. But I just want to tell you, man, this is I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about this. Like you're you're blowing my mind. This is really cool. <laughs> yeah, shit, I dude. think it is. I think it is, and I think I, I, um, I think people need to hear the story and they need to look into it. And I I, I want them to challenge this. You know, that's that's important. You you know your stuff mm -hmm. too. That's that's what's so refreshing. Is I was worried that I would have to do a lot of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, keep spicing it up. You know what I mean, kind of thing. Um, but you, you clearly know your stuff. Anyway, I, I don't want to take up all of our time <laughs> kissing your ass, but I just, I just want you to know this is really great. Part of my challenge is that anytime I try to present myself, try to present my ideas, I cannot just put. I mean, this is exceptional to have a full hour to discuss this, you know, because when you try to summarize that in just a few lines, people are just saying, well, that's bullshit, you know, and, and, and so they don't even give you any opportunity to discuss it. Um, but having the opportunity to discuss it and, and argument a little bit. And as you say, I mean, you know, we didn't go into the, the thick of it, but at least on surface, it looks like, oh, it kind of makes sense, you know, <laughs> so maybe it's worth diving into it a little bit. And I'm, I'm, so hopeful this will happen because the world needs this. Yeah. The world needs to needs to get at peace with this. And there's so much hatred and, and just religion is creating so much pain in the world today that we need to provide uh, rational thinkers and we need to let reason prevail. That's beautiful what you're doing. Well, thank you for saying that. It, it, yeah. it, it kind of reminds me of that old uh, Santayana quote, you know, if we don't we don't learn from the past, we're condemned to yeah. repeat it. That's exactly what you're trying to do here is you're saying, let's, yeah. let's learn from the past, but the real past. Great. You know, not silly stuff, but real, real history. It is the essence of radio. You're telling a story. Well, thank you, uh, Robert. You, you have no idea how blessed I am with this conversation. Mm -hmm.